Welcome everybody. My name is um, Marcus and I suggest um, we get started now. Um, I am a co-chair of the RDA Working Group Persistent Identification of Instruments um, together with uh, Luis Daro, who is on the call as well today, Rolf Kral, who is on the call as well, and Ted Haberman, who um, has a double booking today um, and might join then uh, in the second half. Um, I would like to also thank all the speakers um, who are already uh, on the call as well. Um, I will have a brief overview of the agenda shortly. Um, I will try to moderate this a little bit as best I can. Um, I also have a double, double booking. I have my little daughter next to me who is having dinner. Um, so apologies if I have to drop in and out from the audio or, and or the video um, uh, because I might have to, you know, um, uh, handle or do um, give the dessert or something at some point. Good, great. Um, that being said, I give you um, a brief overview of the RDA Working Group Persistent Division of Instruments on behalf of the Boolean's team. Um, as I usually do, this is a short, tiny URL uh, to the minutes. As you probably have seen, there is a Google Docs linked to the uh, session on the RDA pages. And if you note down this uh, code here for tinyurl.com, um, you will be, or hopefully will be redirected to the right um, Google Docs. And then um, if you want to take notes or post some comments or have some questions, we can use this space as a, um, a place where we can, um, yeah, take uh, talk and communicate as well. I'm not sure I'm, I'm seeing the chat uh, here. It disappeared again. Um, so please, if someone has, yeah. So tinyurl, thanks for copying this, yeah. Um, and also the Google Docs. Great, thank you, Esther and Sven. Um, so that said, I'm giving you a brief overview of what have, has happened largely since actually P14 in Helsinki. So we didn't have a, a session um, in the last plenary. So we are back now with a, with a session, also because we have now uh, the two deliverables published. Um, and we will have more to say about this, but I just give you a quick intro to what these deliverables are. That's on one hand, the paper. We published a paper in the Data Science Journal with a number of authors. And um, here you have um, the, uh, the citation with the DOI, if you like to read this. Um, please do so. It gives um, an overview of what um, the group did over the lifetime and the results. And uh, Lou, Louise Daro will then also uh, tell you a little bit more about this um, soon. Um, this deliverable is now also an um, RDA supporting outputs. Um, so you can find it linked also as in supporting outputs on the RDA pages. There's a URL here in case we share it slide, um, you can also get it from here. Um, then the second deliverable is a living document. So in contrast to the paper, which is a, let's say a static document, um, this is more um, living document. It's a, essentially a white paper where we have a little bit more technical information about um, the approaches that we developed for persistent integration of instruments. And we will also, since it's a living document, we will also then um, take on new, for instance, adoption stories, describe them a little bit so that people who are interested get an overview of the possibilities and how things can, can be done. Um, this is uh, published at Read the Docs. And um, you can find here the URL, rda-pidins-readthedocs.io. Um, we have a little bit of company here in the background. Um, you can look this up and um, it's all on GitHub and we just publish it in a more readable form using read the docs. That was um, an approach that we used here. 
Um, it's all on GitHub, so you can also suggest changes and, and updates. And if you have new adoption stories and, and content that you want to share, um, you can um, ha be, be happy to, to get these um, updates uh, through, for instance, GitHub um, directly. Um, on adoption, I think we have also um, quite a bit of progress, and uh, there will be a number of talks uh, later that will um, detail a little bit this. I have here a slide to give you just a little bit of overview of the institution or um, you know, uh, community of practice and so on that have um, looked at persistent identification and have been thinking about adopting um, the results of this working group. That's great. We have a growing number of um, organizations that are interested in this including, uh, and some of them will be talking today. Um, we have uh, Sven for Sensor Community um, and ICOS is present. Uh, we have um, i for ios present and also uh, B2Inst. So this is the overview. I um, hopefully I didn't overrun already. So I give you a quick introduction to BDINST um, and then we dive into the deliverables. Um, so Louise uh, will present the deliverables in more details. And then we have about 30 minutes for the adoption stories um, at ICOS present and I Envy and Claudia will um, tell you a little bit more what uh, ICOS and Envy is and, and how persistent identification is uh, planned there um, of instruments. Um, and then we have BODC with Louise. Um, she will, BODC as already was one of the test cases in the reported in the paper already. So it was an early adopter and she will um, tell another use case for BODC vessels. Sensor community is an interesting, um, also community here um, present, represented by uh, Sven. And um, this is interesting because it goes a little bit beyond um, the scientific uh, research community as originally taught, but um, so maybe sensors used also by citizen scientists or also people who just like to have um, a little bit of monitoring at home. They can plug in into this sensor community and they are also thinking about persistent identification there. And Sven will talk a little bit about this as well. And then we have Mark um, for B2INS, which I think is also an interesting development um, also within the European context for persistent identification of instruments. Um, I'm really into, uh, looking forward to hear about these stories and hope it's all um, interesting for everyone uh, to hear a little bit um, how the results um, are gradually adopted by various communities. And then we have um, Shoban, who is going to present I4IOS. Um, that's a um, community of practice, to my understanding, uh, in Australia, um, who is discussing also exactly this topic, persistent identification of instrument. And we will hear a little bit um, what's going on in Australia, and also um, hear a little bit what are the plans to collaborate um, uh, with this group. And then we have an open discussion as usual with the remaining time. And um, yeah, that's it from my side. So I um, would hand over to Louise and I'm stopping sharing here. Louise, I suppose you can just um, start with presenting. Yes, thank you, Louise. Okay, is that good? Right, I'm going to move you guys over here. So I can uh, see you. My screen over here. Can you still see my um, presentation? No, we see your Zoom now. Right, okay. The browser. How's that? Yeah, if you can make it full screen. Yeah. Okay. Somehow, somehow that doesn't work. It seems to work only on your side, but I think it's fine. I have seen this already before that somehow it's switching. I think everybody can read it anyway. So please. Has it not come up properly? Um, yeah, I, I don't know when you, I think you have shared the application only maybe. 
Yeah, okay. And I've seen that before that somehow um, when you switch into presenter mode, it doesn't really do that for some reason. So either you um, share the whole screen. That could, that? Yeah, that looks good. Better? Thank you. That's good. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay, let's put it over here now on this screen. <laughs> so I might be looking away a little bit when I talk to you. But never mind. Anyway. So uh, just going to give you a brief overview of the deliverables that we've completed as part of our Kidints group. So just to relate the, uh, the problem that we were trying to solve to begin with, we want to persistently identify real world objects, the real world instruments that uh, everybody uses every day in their laboratory, deploy out in the ocean, etc. So this is instead of the actual material instrument designs. Um, the instruments can be anything. They can be uh, just handheld thermometers, benchtop PCR machines, very topical at the moment, uh, wave radar sensors that we just deploy out in the ocean. Go as big as um, synchrotrons. So why? Do we want to identify instruments? Um, probably the most uh, important reason is that we can actually link the instrument uh, to the data that it produces. So we can put the data uh, into context, essentially. So we can use the capabilities of the instruments to help uh, QC that data and make it more accurate. Uh, another good reason uh, has come about for wanting to uh, persistently identify instruments is that we can start putting metrics to real world assets. So we can show our funders uh, uh, how we're spending our assets and how much they're being used. So our solution was to try and develop uh, 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 recommendations for publishing uh, persistent identifiers uh, that identify instruments. So we have uh, two solutions um, or two deliverables. We have a technical solution, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, as Mark has pointed out, this has actually been published in a journal. And we've just completed um, our sort of recommendations, our white paper. This is sort of operational information for instrument providers who wish to start registering uh, uh, instrument persistent identifiers. So both of these deliverables are available on our Read the Docs uh, repository, uh, which Mark has showed you, and uh, you can access uh, these documents through this uh, URL. So onto the technical solution. Uh, we decided we wanted to be able to, we wanted our users to be able to register instruments uh, in existing PID infrastructures and building uh, a whole new PID infrastructure. Uh, part of the reason for this was uh, sustainability because the PID providers out there are already very well established. Uh, it was also to do with costs. Um, users won't want to have to pay for several different PID services, um, particularly as PIDs are now growing to many, many different types of objects. Um, we decided that PIDs ought to be published with an associated uh, schema of metadata. Uh, the reason for this is it, it just helps with global interoperability. It helps reduce the um, ambiguity around what particular instrument you're looking at. Uh, but it also helps with um, automating the information into workflows. So we did a, a survey with our group members uh, to see what kind of metadata they would like to see in the schema. Uh, we collected uh, 15 use cases. Uh, 10 were considered complete that we were able to, to use. 80% um, of those uh, use cases were from the earth sciences. Uh, and we were able to use this information to actually produce a new metadata schema that you use to publish with your PIDs. Uh, we wanted to keep it open and flexible. Um, part of the reason for this 
You didn't want to start constraining particular values that you might put with um, properties. Uh, the reason for this is because we want it to be used across all sorts of dis disciplines and um, different disciplines have different best practices and standards. Uh, and we didn't want to start uh, making groups move away from their, their preferred community uh, standards. Uh, and then finally, we actually had adoption of this metadata schema with two PID providers. So this was with Data Site and Epic. <clears throat> so with um, Epic PIDs, uh, you can create a metadata schema there when you publish your PIDs using um, the PI, uh, the property labels uh, that we chose, our users chose, um, as part of our survey. With the uh, data set, it's a little bit more tricky. There's a bit of a mapping uh, exercise to be done. Um, and this is because data site is very established. It already has a very uh, core metadata schema, uh, but our, our properties do map very well across to the data site core uh, metadata. So for example, here we've got um, owner, which is our preferred property label that you can use in Epic, but um, the equivalent in data site would be creator. Um, and these two metadata schemas uh, are available on our, on our GitHub repository, including how to map between We cannot our, hear you yeah, anymore. Louis, you're, ah, okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, now you're back. Okay. Excellent. So, did you manage to hear about the uh, metadata schemas? You were just gone a couple yes. of seconds. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Okay. So, moving on from the technical solution, uh, we're now on to the uh, our operational information, our recommendations. This is our white paper. Uh, as Mark has pointed out, this is a, a living document. Um, part of the reason for that is it's constantly open for community review. Um, we've published it on Read the Docs to enable this. Every so often we will take a snapshot of the major version and this will become citable. Um, so you will still be able to cite specific versions of our document. Um, so the key points from our recommendation document is that uh, if you're going to publish an instrument PID, ideally you want to publish it with the metadata schema that we've um, created. Um, each instrument PID ought to resolve to a landing page that identifies the instruments, uh, and there ought to be a sufficient metadata on that landing page to identify that instrument. So in addition to those key points, we also have some practical recommendations as well. Um, so for example, uh, it's good to use common terminologies, things like controlled vocabularies, ontologies, uh, thesauri. Um, different disciplines have different uh, standards for this. Uh, so we're not prescribing uh, what you should use. Uh, I've just got up here uh, an example of uh, the marine community because it's quite a a well-established um, set of controlled vocabularies uh, for instruments that are published on the NERC vocabulary server. We also want to give some more practical information like actually linking the PID to the physical instrument. So potentially you could label instruments using QR codes. Um, and this is quite exciting because some QR code providers now uh, will actually log the time and location a QR code is scanned. So that may help with uh, mobilization of instruments for field work. We give um, recommendations for linking to other PIDs as well. There's the RRID identifier in the US, which uh, describes instrument models. So we have recommendations on how to, um, to include those uh, PIDs in, in our metadata schema. This is quite exciting. Uh, we had a go at trying to link um, instruments to data sets through uh, schema.org. Uh, I think this highlights exactly why uh, the white paper is evolving. Um, so this is the first stab. 
So we've actually linked a uh, data set to uh, a vehicle device uh, through an event that was used to collect the data. And in this, in this case, it was a, a deployment of a research vessel, so the cruise. Um, definitely the first stab. Um, I don't think we, we're that great as schema.org experts in the group, but if anybody out there has got great, you know, good experience using schema.org, please, please contact us and uh, help us with some ideas on how to do this best. Uh, we also give uh, information about how to, you could encode landing pages beyond um, HTML. So, for example, we've got uh, sensor web enablement and sensor ML. Um, we give some good um, how to publish guides. So we've got quite a, an extensive uh, EPIC cookbook. So how to publish at the EPIC uh, API oh, and also at the uh, to publish EPIC handles at the handle system as well. Uh, and then finally, we give information about um, duplication because that could always potentially happen. Um, so we sort of recommend doing deduplication, uh, potentially using our related identifier property. So I think that's the overview from me. Yes. Thank you, Lou. Um, I would ask for any direct quick question from the audience that we can resolve right away. Um, you can use the chat, um, of course, to also ask questions. You can also um, ask to unmute, um, or I'm not sure if you can unmute yourself directly here. Um, raise the hands or something. If there are no questions, then um, Thank you very much, Lou, for the uh, introduction on the deliverables. And then I would uh, move right away to the adoption stories. And uh, the first in line uh, is Claudio. Claudio is uh, working at the ICOS Carbon Portal. I'm sure that he is going to tell more and introduce more this uh, research infrastructure. And um, of course, ICOS has a number of sites and instruments. So it's an interesting use case for persistent identification of instruments. And perhaps, I'm not sure, Claudio, if you are going to touch a little bit also broader in the Henry context of research infrastructures in the environmental sciences. Um, so Claudio, the floor is yours. Um, again, I think you should just be able to grab Presenter yep. mode. Thank yep. you very much. I uh, will try my best here. Um, so you should have a full screen now from my slides, I assume. Um, yeah, as Marcus said, uh, I am working at um, the ICOS Carbon Portal. And um, ICOS, I will give you a very brief uh, overview. Um, it is a European um, infrastructure uh, to measure greenhouse gas concentration and fluxes. We have uh, approximately 150 stations. And what is a little bit unusual maybe for such infrastructures that we cover um, three different domains. Um, the atmospheric uh, ecosystem and uh, ocean uh, part. And th this is a relevant, well, in this part of, of my talk a little bit, because those are well-established communities and they have all their own standards, their own way of working and doing things. Uh, so this is like a hurdle uh, we have at the carbon portal and the carbon portal itself is like a centralized data portal for those three communities integrated in ICOS. So currently um, 
we do collect uh, well a lot of metadata and data obviously uh, so we have like uh, serial numbers and settings and locations and calibration coefficients and uh, things like this um, but then again uh, this information is transferred to a thematic center uh, we call them thematic centers, which is a group of the main experts for ecosystem atmosphere or, or the ocean. And then after it has been there, curated and so on, it will come to the carbon portal. And so this workflow uh, to pass on all, all the relevant um, information uh, this is uh, well very much in adoption and a, a um, process which is still being um, established properly. Um, from a viewpoint uh, of ICOS, uh, our most important thing is the data object. Uh, so we have a full infrastructure now, which automatically creates um, PIDs for data objects. And the data object then is uh, connected to people and station and instruments. And the instruments itself then have uh, sub information as the hardware itself, installation, configuration, the location, and so on. And um, what we have right now is the, this top layer. Uh, this is established with uh, landing pages, citable, and so on. And we are working now on this, uh, uh, the contribution PIDs, uh, like the instruments and stations and people. So we do collect all the information. It is just not gone the full way that we have essentially PIDs for instruments. Um, just as a, for you who do not know how this looks like and uh, my apologies for the poor quality of the image. Uh, this should represent a um, tower we have uh, with many, many sensors and instruments where we collect data. Um, and just to point out, this is uh, one of the hurdles we have to overcome or to integrate in our business logic, that instruments on this tower may belong to the atmosphere community. Uh, or the ecosystem community. So we need to treat them differently in the back end, as in who they belong to and what they measure and how they are uh, linked to data sets. And another part is that we may have a uh, gas analyzer, which is like one instrument, but we have many inlets. So uh, this was uh, always a discussion in, in Pidinst uh, as well, uh, how how do we represent this in the metadata? And uh, this is just a, a, yeah, an example of the metadata which is delivered if you download the data set from our data portal. So we do not have a PID at the moment for the instruments, but you get all the information, the history, the change of filters, maintenance, and so on what kind of, of firmware is installed, serial number. So um, yes, we have, I don't know, about, about 3000 instruments and we need to really cover all the history of, of those instruments and the changes uh, because what we are aiming for as well is to have a data set, let's say for 2018, but that means that uh, it is possible that two instruments have been providing at the same location to the data because it broke or something and so it needs to be replaced. And I think the interoperability and machine interaction to handle a data set where then more than one instrument is linked to the same time series that is still, yeah, we need to work on that a little bit. 
Um, so for us, the next step is we have all the information. We need to um, establish uh, the workflow that the metadata is automatically submitted to our data portal such that we then can create um, PIDs. So we have this workflow already for the data for EPIC um, uh, for, and data site already. So it, it is not so much that we need to establish that link to create the PIDs, but to have the information and put them in a, in a good order in our triple store and um, make a good structure out of it. Uh, and then obviously having a uh, informative landing page. And at the moment we are thinking we might go towards a JSON LD uh, object within our landing page. Um, but yeah, so this is the plan we have. And I think this is already everything from my side. I'm more than happy to take any questions or then going to the next adoption story. Yes, thank you very much, Claudio, for the great overview at ICOS. Um, yeah, any questions? I, I hope you can just unmute, huh? so there's not much needed here. Yeah, I'm just looking at the chat box if there is anything. Yes. There was a little bit of discussion on data site and uh, Martin is happy to support that, um, describing a data site cookbook. That's great, thank you, Martin. And other than that, I think there was no direct question to you. I saw that's true, correct. Okay, um, we can also discuss all this later in the 30 minutes, so if there are no questions at this point, um, thank you very much, uh, Claudio. Then I would like to ask uh, Luis to come back on stage and um, talk a little bit about the BODC vessels use case. Thanks, Marcus, for meeting me there. I was having trouble finding the button. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I'll talk to you about uh, instrument PIDs uh, and the UK research vessels. Uh, this is part of a, uh, an ongoing initiative that we've, uh, ongoing, we've actually only really started it in the last year called iOcean. So uh, a drive to, to um, uh, improve data from the research vessels uh, across the UK. Uh, so uh, in the UK, we have three large research vessels. They are managed by our sort of government funding body, which is the Natural Environment Research Council. Uh, Research vessels, they're there, they're great for um, transporting uh, scientists and their equipment uh, to remote locations. Uh, but what's quite nice about them is that they're actually observing platforms in their own right, because they have uh, a whole array of uh, sensors that are fixed to the ship that are measuring the seawater continuously uh, 24 hours as the ship is underway, uh, doing all the uh, scientific deployments uh, in its, one of its missions. The problem is for our research ships is that they are expensive to run. They cost about 10,000 uh, to 20,000 K uh, a day, once you start including all the fuel costs. So there has been a, a big drive from our, our stakeholders to try and maximize uh, the science from the research ships. And one of the ways to do that is that we could actually you know, improve uh, what we call this depth to desktop uh, data pipe pipelines, particularly from the fixed sensor arrays, because they actually have a lot of scientific value themselves. 
<clears throat> so one of the key drivers, or one of the key, key directives uh, from our stakeholders has been that we need to improve the provenance and the metadata uh, from these fixed sensor arrays. So of course, one of the ways that we can do that is we can use uh, the instrument PIDs to link uh, the metadata of the instruments uh, to the actual data itself. Uh, just a very simplistic diagram here uh, of what we'd like to do. Uh, so we have um, a node, let's say data node uh, at BODC, which is on shore. Uh, we have data nodes on each of our research vessels and there'd be a boat out at the sea, out at sea. And BODC will act as the central catalog, so a central reference. Uh, BODC will be the one publishing uh, the new PID, uh, PIDs for instruments. Uh, and they contain a lot of uh, extensive central metadata for those instruments as well. So the vessels at sea can then um, check with the central node uh, for particular persistent identifiers and then they can use them to label their instruments and they can use them to label the data which they then send back to us. And then at our central node, we can link the PID, through the PID, the data to the metadata. Part of the reason to have this central node is, is, is to try and avoid duplication because uh, the vessels can actually exchange sensors between them. So we don't want the vessels to be registering the same instrument. The other thing, this, this linking of data to metadata on shore uh, works really well if you have limited bandwidth. Um, the vessels won't want to send huge amounts of data uh, back with, with the data. They just want to really send the data and the identifier, and then we'll do all the linking of the data and mass data to ensure. Uh, and of course, uh, using global identifiers in addition to our local identifiers means that we can be interoperable uh, with international bodies so we can easily share our information. And uh, I've got to say, actually, I just found out this afternoon that we've actually secured some money to do this, which is really good. Um, so at the BODC node, what helps us uh, with us supplying our metadata and potentially QS QCing data is that we actually publish uh, all of our instruments using Center ML. Uh, so these are sort of uh, machine readable resources, machine actionable metadata essentially. Uh, so we can link um, an instrument's capabilities to the data and this should hopefully help with automation. We're hoping that this could also potentially help with uh, machine, uh, machine learning and QC routines as well. So that's all I have to say on research vessels. Great, thanks. Thank, uh, thank you, Louise. Um for the update at BODC and the examples. Um, I'm just looking at the chat. There was some discussion about data science schema version 4.4, um, picking up some of the requirements um, that come out from the PID for the PDNs group. That's great to hear. Um, I can't see any direct question to you, Louise. So unless, um, let's give a couple of, a bit of time, maybe someone posts something. Okay, this doesn't seem to be the case. Then thank you very much, Louise, for this um, second um, adoption story. And then we have um, Sven. Sven uh, will be talking about the sensor community. I'm not sure whether you have heard this, but I'm sure that uh, Sven is going to be introducing it shortly and telling us how persistent identification of instruments um, is of interest in this community. Thank you, Sven. I see already your slides. So the um, floor is yours. Thank you. Sven, if you're talking, he can't hear you.
when. Ah, can you hear me now? Okay, now we can hear you. Uh, yes. Sorry, I, did, I didn't find too many windows open. I didn't see the yes. button anymore. Sorry, uh, can Thank you see you. my screen still or? We can see your screen. Screen, we did, yeah. In uh, if you can make that, yes, perfect. Okay, wow. so sorry for the day. So uh, no welcome everybody. Um, right. So um, I have two, two, uh, three roles while I'm actually speaking this evening. So first of all, as a citizen, I would like to support this idea of the citizen science project. I'm going to talk about. Uh, but also as a researcher, I would like to reuse the data I will talk about, but also as a, as KVDG, a member of KVDG, I'm interested, of course, in uh, providing PRDs and uh, supporting the, the PRD idea in general. So what is Sensor the Community, if you didn't hear about that one? Uh, this is a citizen science project. It means uh, every everybody of us could actually join in in a very large project, I would say. Uh, the the main idea uh, when it's initiated was to measure the air pollution. Uh, so it came from a little city in Germany where the air pollution is a big issue due to high traffic uh, situations. Um, and then it spread out of the world and also in other countries uh, where they have similar sub projects and projects which we uh, present here today. The idea is that you can get an affordable cheap sensor to attach it to your house, to your garden house, wherever and uh, provide the data to a very central database. Uh, as you can see on the map, uh, this is the current status of this morning. You can see in green and yellow the, the, the measurements and also the locations of the sensors. Uh, there's extensions, of course, further from the air pollution or fine dust. Uh, there is uh, also measurements for radioactive materials and also for noise. But I will focus on the air pollution today. Uh, this is how a typical sensor would look like. It's ridiculous in comparison to the vessels you just saw in the other presentation. <laughs> um, but the interesting point is we have about 11,000 of these sensor stations. And if you think of that East Central is equipped with the particular density or fine dust me measurement and a temperature measurement and humidity, it actually consists of two sensors. Or, so we have about 20, 22,000 measurements or sensors. Uh, this is spread all over 68 countries, uh, and we have about 9 billion measurements measured in our databases. And uh, this is quite an in interesting number and large number, and it's still increasing furthermore. Uh, the very typical setup is basically uh, you go to one of these uh, shops, get a cheap SDS or the 11 fine dust sensor and a cheap uh, temperature sensor, and it costs about 30 euros, 30 dollars roughly in, in total, and then you are a member of a bigger project. And um, as you can see, it's, it's very straightforward. You can, of course, start discussing this is a cheap sensor. It doesn't, uh, it's not reliable, and it's not good for scientific standards. But just the pure amount of sensors and measurements we have, you can still do very nice and interesting science out of it. And this is why I would like to support this. And um, so what happens actually if you attach the sensor to your home, uh, it will just send uh, measurements and um, with the geolocation. That's pretty much everything you have. Uh, so what we need to do is basically we have to collect all the information from the sensors on a typical way, uh, on, a tip, on, a, on, a, on a standardized, standardized way uh, to actually um, yeah, enhance the usage of the, of the data of the measurements we have. So what we have, we have to build up a rather complex infrastructure and workflows. You don't have to go in detail in the, in the figure on the right, but you have to just assume that it's very dynamic. So sensors might appear, disappear. If, uh, uh, so we have a lot of errors in the data if someone moves or uses the wrong geo coordinates. Uh, there is, of course, this is the most uh, the biggest problem we have actually for the PID is that we have a lot of missing data. So we don't know the owner. So if someone just attaches the sensor at home, uh, the sensor might send uh, the measurements, but not the owner. It just sends the key location and the measurement. So what we do is basically we, we set up a database. So we started with a, uh, a graph database to at least have a, a grip of what do we have so far. And so we have the position, we can, so to say, compile it in a country, in a city. We know what kind of sensor type it is. is it's, it's fine dust, it's, it's uh, noise, and so on. So we can fill, of course, already a lot of these um, required metadata sets of the PIT group. But there's still a lot of things missing. 
and um, this is the current status what we have. So we what we do is in our in infrastructure that we have a nightly run to actually fill all the necessary information we can get from the sensors into uh, actually um, PIDs. So you have an example PID we create in our nightly run. So, so far we have implemented only three types, not all of those which are required. And it's still a test prefix, but it's, um, the, the first steps are done. This the infrastructure is set up. So we just have to include a bit more code to actually finalize this uh, PID um, uh, creation. Uh, so the next steps we have to do actually is to say finalize the code to get more metadata into this. And what we need to do is also providing an API or website to get more information from the actual owners of the instruments. So um, but it's, where's the, the question is what kind of, what type of instrument or sensor did you actually use? Who is the owner and stuff like this? And uh, if possible, we can include the owner to the metadata. If not, we can still say it's uh, owned by the committee project. So there's a, a few open questions about the metadata or the types you have to add to our project. But uh, I hope I can tell more in the next presentations uh, and hopefully find show the final solution of our adoption story. And of course, the next step is to invite you all to get a sensor and join the community project uh, to even increase more data, more sensors, more countries and more data. Yeah, so thanks and I'm open for any question. Uh, so Sven, I, have a, I actually have a question, um, partly because I've been looking at citizen science myself. Um, and you, you've been saying that you, at the moment, you don't actually include the owner information. Do you have any problems with sort of data protection um, would that be a problem if you're actually including that information? Yeah, so it was already discussed uh, at several different occasions um, that we might ask the, the owner to provide this information. Um, but we're also aware of that due to the privacy regulations, we might not get this information. So especially the owner and the geolocation might be wrong or misleading and so on. So in worst case, we would have zero zero as a geolocation and the the owner of the instrument would be the community and not a, a person or institution whatsoever. Especially in foreign countries where, the, where we don't know any, any regulations about the GDPR or privacy regulations, we have to be more careful about this or if you collect the data, we might not provide it properly. Is it, is it possible that you could use persistent identifiers uh, to get over actually having somebody's name and knowing exactly where they're located, et cetera. Because if you have a, a sensor and you know its location um, and then you match it to someone's name. You know, so so technically you, you could still use persistent as identifiers and can mark those fields which contain private data as uh, non-public. So yeah. the information will be in the database but not readable publicly only when you have uh, the credentials to read the database. But the question is if this is the idea of the pit inst working group or if this in general the idea of open science um so we have to be we have to distinguish here between open science and citizen science projects um, where we might not be able to show all the data to everybody yes uh, thank you sven um i also have a quick question you said that um the um, so the metadata schema, uh, the PDN metadata schema that we uh, developed doesn't um, include all the exactly um, all the attributes that you uh, have or might want. Um, are you nevertheless happy with this? Because there is of course a, a separation that we discussed extensively between the metadata for the persistent identifier and then the metadata that you typically have on the landing page, which might be you know, very heterogeneous depending on the sensor. So you are happy nevertheless with this separation um, uh, metadata about the PID um, and metadata that, you know, you might have on the landing page for the instrument. Is that still something that you can live with or do you want to see more of these attributes um, at the PID level? Yeah, I would actually know as more the other way around. So there is more requirements from the pit inst uh, schema, for example, the manufacturer, uh, which is 0.5, I think, in the list. Uh, so we, we might not know the manufacturer of the instrument of the sensor. 
Yeah, so we cannot provide it at all. Uh, so we, we, we can have a landing page with more information. That's absolutely fine. And we, I just think we don't require more information in, in the schema of the Pittens group. But the other, the other way around, we might not be able to fill out all the necessary fields. And the question is by mm. how much it's required. Right. Maybe a comment on that. Uh, you might want to uh, adopt the, for the standard values for unknown information from the data site schema. So even if it's a mandatory field, it's it's better to 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 explicitly fill in I don't know it rather than to leave it out. And there are standard so you can just take from the data set schema there are standard values for different types of reasons why you don't know it, uh, and to put that in and yeah, that's pretty much a very good idea. Uh, I think we will implement this. Yeah. Uh, of, co of course, we, tr we try to ask the owners or the users to provide as much as possible information. But I'm not sure if a citizen who just attached the sensor at, at, at his home, uh, at his home, he would like to actually read more about his sensor and sit down and add more information to a website. This might be too much trouble for the, the citizen. Uh, which is my, who might not be a researcher, but just a, a friendly guy attaching a sensor. Um, so we try to collect as much as possible regarding the privacy regulations. And if not, yeah, then maybe this what you just, just suggested is a good idea. I have um, um, just, sorry, who was talking? Yeah, um, Marcus, this is Ted. Yes, hi, Ted. Uh, Sven, a really very interesting um, presentation uh, you know, everybody, everybody likes citizen science and, um, and what I'm, I'm you know, this question of, of creating the metadata have, have there been discussions that you're aware of, um, about, uh, benefits that users or instrument owners might get from, from filling out metadata? I mean, could we, is there some kind of groups or user groups or you know some some something that have, have you thought about any things like that in the project? Yeah, there, there's two ways. So the first of all, there's the benefit of the community to be to be more visible. Yeah, the same is true maybe for owner to say I'm proud of being member of the community project. Here you have a link to the landing page where you can find my sensor and the data to my sensor. I think the third part is that the benefit of the of the research that we can actually uh, use the data. So far, most of the research there is no almost no research done. So we just collect massively data, but we have to make it usable and findable and and so on. So the classical PRD story, of course. Yes. Uh, so Marcus, I think there's a question in the comments. Yeah, exactly. I was just about to get to Chris uh, as well. So Chris, there is a, uh, Sven, there is a question from Chris in the chat. How do you ensure that the citizen provided data is valid? Hmm. Envy? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it, 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 we, we already thought about the problem that, um, so we have, for example, each sensor has a unique ID, which is sent with the data. And uh, so the question, who is the owner of the ID? So we can start saying once you can register an ID and then you get a token, a kind of password, and you can only modify your own ID and nobody else is allowed to, to assign or to modify this sensor ID. But still the question, if the initial assignment is correct, um, there's a lot of uncertainties uh, which we might not be able to tackle as it is a pretty open project. Uh, everybody can just attach it and yeah, so, and with all these uncertainty, un uncertainties, you have to live with, I guess. Also when you later on work with the data itself. Yeah, this is also to my understanding about the data really uh, meeting a certain minimum standard of quality. And I guess it's, um, yeah, you have this typical problem with maybe low cost sensors. Um, they might not be very accurate, but you have a lot of them in the same region and then you can iron out um, the errors of individual sensors and so on. Um, I guess that's one approach. Um, you, you do it over quantity. Um, but of course, these uh, sensors have generally a, a lower quality since they are low cost. 
um, another, but yeah, in the interest of time, I'm skipping my um, additional comment or question. Um, I think it's, um, we need to move on. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sven, for the introduction to the sensor community. And then I would like to ask uh, Mark as the last speaker for the uh, adoption stories to talk a little bit about what's going on at the B2inst and what is B2inst, um, since uh, probably most of you have not heard of this uh, potentially new service uh, coming up. So Mark? Yeah. Um, yeah. I will start sharing my screen. Yeah, we can see the slides. Okay. Hopefully it will go in the correct presentation mode. Looks like perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, about uh, B2Inst and that is an uptake of the uh, PD metadata template and how to see we can provide a, a registry for this. There's a collaboration also between EUDAT, DataSite and EPIC uh, and uh, to see what we can uh, do on this. And to, to, for me, I started really late in the whole process uh, because I first were notified by this working group uh, during the Helsinki uh, plenary. And, and there I thought, well, oh, this is a very interesting, very interesting topic. And also saw there already uh, some parts of the uptakes from, from Epic and DataSite, uh, which was also already shown by earlier slides as, okay, this is an uptake by uh, those organizations. Me coming from uh, uh, SERP, we also are partner within uh, Epic, within UDAP, and within DataSite, we have uh, much collaboration and discuss a lot of topics. Uh, with uh, persistent identifiers and to see how we can jointly work together. And this was certainly one of the areas where we could work uh, together. But one of the thoughts which I had was uh, having the metadata schema defined, that is very, very interesting, but that does not automatically provide the service where you can register those persistent identifiers. So you have to register at your local uh, local repository where you collect all this information. You can assign a persistent identifier uh, from Epic or from uh, from data site, but maybe some uh, organizations are not looking for that. They want to implement an own repository, but they are looking to see, okay, where is a repository or registry where I can assign uh, uh, metadata on uh, for instruments and receive a persistent identifier. And there, from there, the, the thinking uh, process started, but also discussions with uh, Epic and uh, DataSite uh, uh, started. Uh, coming from uh, EUDAT, we have been uh, uh, already have an, a data repository platform. We offer already a service, which is called the B2Share, uh, as, as an open public repository where you can uh, publish your, your data sets. Uh, but it is also uh, a platform uh, where you can easily set up a data repository platform on yourself. And from this, I thought, okay, we have the possibility to uh, easily change the metadata schema within a B2Share instance. Can we not use this to provide a service where uh, we support the metadata schema, which has been provided by uh, the PED for Inst Instruments Working Group, and provide a service where um, communities can register, easily register uh, instrument and receive a persistent identifier on this. And for this, we set up a pilot instance uh, where we support uh, the uh, PED uh, metadata schema. Uh, users can register in the service and start registering uh, metadata on instruments. What is, uh, uh, what is then uh, provided? Uh, it will provide a, a landing page. Uh, within the registration process, we uh, ask uh, users to fill in all the metadata, which is at least mandatory according to the uh, uh, PED uh, metadata scheme, which has been provided. And this is then, uh, you can register a persistent identifier. Uh, what type of persistent identifier you receive we uh, provide in BOI. Uh, so we also register the metadata in uh, at data site. Data site provides us a DOI. 
So, and you can receive this DOI, including pointing to the landing page of, uh, of the service. Um, what we also uh, are able to support is, for example, that you can add additional uh, resources. For example, you can add files to, to the registration. That can be very uh, diverse files, can be user manuals, can be pictures, can be all kinds of files which are related to the instrument. So you can uh, extend the, the registration beyond just the metadata. Uh, what is also possible that you can version the information. So if there are some changes within the instrument, so that you can uh, change the metadata schema or not change the metadata which you have visited to a new version. Secondly, what is also possible uh, was also possible that we can support extensions to the metadata schema. What the PED for Instrument uh, Working Group has established is a basic, a basic metadata schema. But if you look at many of the use cases, there are many different uh, extensions which are requested by or used by different communities. And this is possible, and I will go uh, uh, back on this uh, a little bit later to have an example of this. Uh, what is also uh, uh, what we can provide is an API so that you do the registration of uh, the uh, persistent identifiers or at least the metadata via an API. Because if you have many uh, different uh, instruments, then uh, doing this manually or via the website is very cumbersome. So if you can automate this, uh, then it makes it a lot easier. We have been talking, for example, with the EPOS community, which has about 6,000 different sensors, which are located somewhere in, uh, in Europe. But registering 6,000 instruments by hand or via the website, uh, that is not, uh, not very interesting, because that is a lot of work. If you can automate it, because they have already all this information available within the database, uh, they can easily extract this information within, from the database, generate a script so that they can run through the, through the information and register automatically uh, the, uh, the metadata within the registry and receive a persistent identifier. Uh, we can support community extensions. Uh, this is just an example, which we have seen from, from the GitHub uh, page, where the different communities have already provided more information. And we use this to see, okay, how does this support, can be, this be supported within, within the service? Um, I think the uh, community extensions are, can be very useful if you have many different uh, uh, instruments or very much the same instrument, but you are located at many different locations then you can add, for example, geospatial location information uh, in the extensions, which are at the moment not yet described within uh, the basic PD uh, metadata schema. This is, for example, an example which has been uh, provided by uh, ASCAD, which describes a lot of additional information, which is very specific to the community, and the community can control this what type of information should be then added within the extension. Uh, the other aspect is registration of position identifiers is one. But the second question is, how do we want to use this, uh, this, uh, this PED, but also the metadata? But that was already provided within the introduction that there are many different use cases for using the position identifiers and the metadata from citation, but also using them actively within workflows and analysis of, uh, of, uh, of the data. And I think that can be uh, supported because you can retrieve easily this information via the API. Uh, for uh, setting up, we set up a pilot and then we did to reach out to a few uh, people which we think well, could be of interest to look at this uh, service. Uh, to get the initial feedback. Uh, we uh, had communication with ICOS, with Maggie, uh, EPOS, Luca Trani, uh, but also with Marcus Stucker to see and evaluate, okay, what is your first initial feedback? Is that a useful uh, 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 registry? Uh, can we go forward on this? And what type of changes would you like to see to make it more, uh, more useful? Um, what we got as feedback was, uh, some of the mandatory fields which were requested uh, are less an 
are not always uh, always known. And that is, was also one of the things which you already saw also in the comments of the chat, that not all feeds are av already available in the, in the example Sven was providing. But we can have the solution as provide a default answer if something is not, is not available. Uh, the community extensions was also very looking. For example, in the use case as uh, with, with EPOS, but also with ICOS, if you have many instruments which are very similar, but are located at different locations, you can provide this additional uh, information. The API was, uh, was uh, seen as useful because of the registration procedure, so that you can automate a lot of, uh, lot of things for the registration. Um, within the current service, the fields are just uh, uh, provided, but uh, for make it more useful, the script uh, would be more useful to have descriptive tests of what the field precisely means or how it can be used. Within the community page, we provide an extended uh, example of the description of the metadata scheme, including also from the community. But it would be helpful if this is already available when you do the registration of the information itself, so that you do not have to switch between the community page and uh, the registration. Uh, for the metadata fields, uh, some more flexibility of the possibilities which you can provide in information. Uh, for example, if you have identifiers that you can provide an ORCID for the people or a URL to where more information can be found. Um, and at the moment within the service, you only show the fields which are filled in, but it would be very helpful to also show the fields which are not, fi not filled in, so that you have a complete overview of the information which is being uh, provided. Uh, what are the next steps? We want to uh, run this uh, pilot, and therefore I would also invite people from this working group to provide feedback. Just try out the, the service, provide feedback if it is useful, if it is, uh, and if it is not useful, that is also variable feedback. Um, you can provide the uh, pilot instance at the uh, URL provided. At the moment, it is really a pilot instance. So at the moment, no guarantees on the availability of the service or the data. Uh, we also make use of test prefixes. So the PDs generated are not globally resolvable. Also not the DOI which is provided is globally resolvable, but they are available via the local uh, search instance from, uh, from data side. Um, data side is updating its schema so that it is further supporting uh, instrument information within their core schema. And this is also what we are going to use when we do the registration of the DOIs uh, uh, within uh, the instance, within the service. Uh, and also, if you have the PEDs and the PEDs are registered, they are out then automatically also included within the PED graph. This also data site is working, working at. Uh, and finally, I want to thank uh, Martin Fenner and Ulrich uh, from uh, Data Site and from Epic in uh, collaborating on this uh, on this project. Yes, Any thank questions? you, Mark. Oops, sorry. Um, yeah, thank you, Mark. Um, I'm conscious about time, um, so I suggest anyone who has questions uh, to just post them in the chat. I had a already one and uh, Mark, if you can look at them and reply directly because we have still a uh, show on and maybe there are a couple of minutes left for a few discussions, um, but it's um, almost um, uh, uh, over time. So uh, show if you could uh, introduce you us to the I for IOS uh, committee of practice. Um, and no worries. I'll just um, I'll pull up my screen. That one. Yeah, we can see the slides. Ah, uh, excellent. Um, no, wrong button. <laughs> Sorry, there we go. So can everyone see this perfect. okay? Yes. Excellent. Grand. So I'm, I'm going to move through this fairly quickly as well, because I'm aware of time and I want to give us uh, lots of time to to chat. So my name is Siobhan McCafferty. Um, I'm the project manager, I'm a project manager at the ARDC um, and I'm the facilitator for I4I Oz, which is identifies for instrumentation Australasia. So Australia and New Zealand currently 
um, and we hope to gather people from around the region as well. So I want to give you a, a little bit of detail about i for i Oz, um, about what we're doing and how it relates to the Pittance Group um, and really what we're doing here. So here we go. Um, we're a community of practice. Um, it began with a series of conversations at the University of Sydney um, about how to identify instruments. And we soon realised that was a really common story across a lot of institutions and research groups. So we wanted to um, pull the community together to talk about standards for instrument identification, what other institutions were doing. Um, and there's, there was a number of really common threads that you'll, you'll find familiar. So was there an accepted method and identifier? What kind of use cases were people using? And was there an international discussion in this area? So I've been involved in the, the pittance group here at RDA for a little while, um, and it's a, an area of interest for me. So we were aware that there was international discussion going on. Um, so this group was formed as a community of practice, and we have a series of aims. They are to support and develop best practice for instrument PIDs, to share current identification practices and developments, <clears throat> to connect activities in Australasia with international activities and to raise awareness of technical requirements for instrument identifiers. We have a series of uh, regular activities, which uh, I won't go into in depth here, but we have meetings, we have a Google group and a web page, um, and you're very welcome to be involved in that as well. If you'd like, you can find us at uh, the URL there. I'll pop that into the chat as well after. Um, we have a series of harmonization and standardization activities as well. And most interestingly for today, we are hoping to provide use cases um, for the, the pittance schema. And we have four members of the community of practice who are contributing. Um, and given our time zones, uh, we are lucky to have um, Yvette and Mark from, uh, sorry, not Mark, Chris from uh, the University of Auckland here. Um, thank you very much for waking up early. Um, not quite as early as me, it's four o'clock in the morning now. Um, excuse me if I seem a little bit sleepy and crazy. Um, so we've been putting together a use case paper um, and that's got the University of Auckland, um, CSIRO, which is the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation Australia, the National Imaging Facility at the University of Queensland and the University of Melbourne. So we decided to use um, as a base uh, the taxonomic database working group, so TDWG use case analysis framework. Um, Ted, who's also on this call, recommended this to us, uh, and we thought it was a really useful way of um, sharing a common vocabulary while we, we put together our use cases. So I'll really quickly go through the use cases and then talk um, a little bit about our um, uh, outcome from the from uh, looking at these and say some recommendations that we have around them. So the first one was the University of Auckland um, and that was development of an instrument data repository for the university with a connected research data ecosystem. Really familiar to everyone here. Um, purposes were asset management, instrument data management and facilitating fair data, which was um, good to get in there. We looked at CSIRO, CSIRO's um, water quality data collection instrument and workflows description, um, more sensors there, and it was describing sensing instruments, um, recording metadata about deployment, location site information, uh, and they were already starting to use JSON and JSON-LD there, so they wanted to augment and standardise that. Um, National Imaging Facility, who have been involved in this group, um, kind of from the outset of seeing, yeah, Louise is nodding, cool. Um, that NIF is national, um, but it has nodes across the states. I think it has 23 different nodes um, across Australia. UQ is their, their uh, kind of head node where um, the national group is based. Uh, and they have instruments that people use, obviously. So they wanted to identify instruments in a national organization, describe and track uh, uh, track date of outputs and to track instrumentation use. Uh, and the last one is University of Melbourne. So they were at a much earlier stage and were really interested to be involved um, in our conversation about use cases. 
to look at what does a use case look like? Um, and they wanted to, uh, much like the University of Auckland, um, facilitate booking of instruments uh, locally and also nationally, link and track instrument outputs, and that was data and descriptions of the instruments, and to uh, outline commonalities across the internal use cases. So there was a lot of common issues and themes, which sounds a lot like the, the themes that led to i for i oz So what is an instrument? How do we describe an instrument as a physical entity? Um, and as a side conversation there, um, the conversation about software as an instrument was um, is really important and perhaps needs a little more um, conversation. Um, how do we measure the provenance of input and output data from instrument use? How do diverse research communities build common assessment and discovery tools? Um, how granular do descriptions need to be? And machine readability as key to fair data and provenance. So we have a, a white paper that we've put together that will be up on the, the I4I Oz group um, webpage and I'll post the link as I mentioned. You're really welcome to have a look at it. Um, feedback would be great. We're still um, just out of the draft phase, just metamorphosed into an actual paper. Um, and our recommendations there are to extend the engagement with developers at previous standards. Um, we had a, a lot of input from people in, in geoscience in particular saying, um, we, we really want to uh, help the standard become uh, fully accepted by all these communities. There's been a lot of discussion. We wanna make sure that those previous discussions are still being pulled into this development. Um, and the, the most important recommendation um, or you know, point that we want to make is that we need to ex expand our selection of use cases um, out of non-traditional uh, in, into non-traditional STEM groups, social sciences and humanities. Um, and it, there is some previous work in this area and we know that uh, in particular humanities, when they work with, um, with instrumentation or when they work with, um, with science-y kind of areas, they do it in a, a way where there's not a lot of bleed through, there's not a lot of um, technical work done by the humanities researchers and there's not a lot of humanities work done by the technical researchers. Um, but there is a need for both communities to have consensus across, across um, how they're describing things and, and things like provenance um, and, and data sets. Uh, social sciences as well, they sometimes have massive data sets uh, and it might be from very simple um, instruments, uh, but there's, there's still a need to um, engage with those communities. And we hope that communities of practice such as ourselves can really help with that outreach into communities. Um, and we're, we're very keen to be involved in that area. So I'll stop there and thanks very much for listening. And I hope we can have some, some more conversations around this. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Shoban, especially um, you joining so early in the morning or let's say middle of the night. Um, yeah, <laughs> no worries. It. I'm happy um, to be here. Thank you. So, um, yes, yeah, so we are true to the presenters and I'm really sorry that um, it's already almost over. So. Um, there were some discussions um, in the chat. Uh, as far as I can tell, the questions are more or less um, answered uh, in the chat. So if anyone has still a burning uh, question, either just unmute, you should be able to do that. Also as a non-co-host, as far as I can tell. Or use the chat. If there are no questions, I have uh, a few, my main, mainly comments, well, also questions actually. And I will just start from the bottom. So the last presenter, Shoban, um, I think we discussed this um, already. Um, one, one issue that I have uh, very much at, at heart is um, how can we ensure that the, two groups here, PDINST and um, I4IOS, ensure that they have a common development. So it would be great to ensure that there is a, um, a common uh, roadmap uh, so that we are not diverging in implementations. And so do you have any thoughts about this? Of course, you joining, um, we had already also exchange between the groups. 
um, members of your community joining PID, um, that can also help ensuring that we have a, a shared understanding. Do you have any thoughts beyond this? Uh, I think the the shared um, time zone meeting has been really important. Unfortunately, I can't normally make it, um, but I know that members of the community of practice do attend, um, and I know it has been really useful for helping people feel like we're part of that um, international discussion. Um, I wonder if we could maybe have something um, as a, a wider community of practice in a way to uh, to allow people to to join in. Um, but that might be in not having meetings, like maybe um, more shared documentation development, um, or even you know, as we've done with the use cases, maybe maybe we could uh, you know extend those and make sure that we've got representation from from different areas, have those subgroups working together. It's a difficult thing um, to do, so I'm I'm happy to hear any suggestions as well. Maybe in this this time of um, virtual working, we'll we'll find a way to to solve this. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you. Um, since I don't see anyone um, in the chat, I'm just pausing a little bit. Mm -hmm. So David, um, this group has made great progress and um, it was started to for more. Thank you. Um, maybe have a summary of the plans. Um, or maybe just lead us hopes. Okay, so um, from my side, very quickly, um, so this group is now officially um, in maintenance mode, I think it's called at RDA. So the lifetime of the group has actually ended. Um, so what we are doing now, since we have the law uh, published the deliverables, is essentially maintaining them um, and also work on, uh, let's say, catalyzing supporting adoption stories. That's the main goal for the group. Uh, something that we might think uh, for the future is to, uh, depending on the community feedback also, what we learn from the community, seeing what works, what doesn't, maybe there are gaps that we can identify for a future uh, new um, uh, working group that would then tackle specifically those, um, those issues. And that has been also discussed as a potential um, future direction, but currently it's really um, about collecting um, uh, adoption stories from the community and, and supporting them. Um, I have a quick question to all the speakers still. Um, do you think that you have um, a demo uh, for your um, adoption story, especially those who are more planning for implementation by perhaps the next plenary? Uh, for, for me, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. the, the pilot instance is available. Uh, so uh, some testing, that would be very nice so that if people are able to register instruments to see if this is working. Then we have some more exemplar uh, uh, examples for from the community side. Uh, that would be very nice. Thank you, Mark. Um, Claudio? Yeah, from my side, I, I hope uh, it is not only a demo, but that we can implement it uh, for all the instruments at ICOS. Uh, in that regard, uh, I have a question to to Mark, as in we have our own uh, prefix. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, for us, I, I don't see the connection to um, be to share because it is, uh, you know, I, I could see Sven uh, with uh, the community science um, centers, you know, to use that. Uh, but for, for a group, uh, we have all the infrastructure already in place. So uh, if you see um, a, a collaboration there, then I would be, yeah, would be interesting for me to, to, to hear that. But maybe that uh, yeah, the time is a little bit advanced now. Yeah, yeah we can uh, discuss uh, afterwards or exchange uh, emails uh, on this. Uh, I can contact sure. yeah. uh, Maggie to, to, to get your email address. Uh, but it is also, yeah, uh, you have already uh, an infrastructure available. You have a lot of uh, uh, information already available. Uh, therefore, you can do the registration and maintain PDs uh, within your own uh, infrastructure. 
but uh, I think that there are also uh, many different communities at different uh, uh, levels and maturity levels, which uh, do not have the infrastructure. So then, no, no, absolutely. Uh, have, I think it is a great offer. effort. Uh, but, uh, absolutely. That, that, was, that, was, that was the use case. Okay, thank you. And also perhaps uh, Louise, um, how is your idea there in the timeline? Um, definitely not by, I don't think we will be able to by the next meeting, which will be, I presume, in March, but definitely yeah. for the following meeting, we should have something in place. And Sven, how is your? Uh, yes, I guess we will have uh, definitely new updates. So uh, I think we will have a new prefix and maybe all the 20,000 required PIDs uh, minted until then, definitely. Great. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm still looking at the chat. Um, there seems to be no other comments. So it's also 7.30, uh, at least in my time zone. Um, I have one last uh, brief comment. Um, if anyone in the audience um, thinks you have an adoption story for persistent education of instruments, if you could please note this in the Google Docs uh, or and or get in touch uh, with us, that would be uh, super. Um, if you could do that, then we can um, yeah, hear, hear from you and get in touch and, and, and get to understand uh, what your adoption uh, story looks like and also perhaps also support it. So um, I see already people dropping off. I understand it's 7.30. So I would like to uh, thank all the speakers very much for joining this session. Um, in particular, again, Shoban for making it this early. And I um, thank all the audience for joining today. I hope it was interesting, gave you a, a little bit in, an overview of what we are doing. And yes, with this, um, thank you very much. Uh, everyone have a great RDA. And uh, in these times, everyone, please uh, stay healthy. Thanks for joining and um, bye, bye for now. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.